today I want to look back at where we've been. Now, of course, sometimes I revisit a topic because maybe I discussed topic A and B and then went to topic C. But then later I want to discuss topic D, so I revisit A and B briefly. But today I want to intentionally stop and look back and focus on fun, some things we've discussed. Now, my object here is to do natural theology, and the word natural means I want to make this as compatible with science as possible, with what we know of the natural world. But I have made some assumptions that I want to point out explicitly. I've assumed that the ultimate ground of being exists objectively. Now, I mentioned when I initially introduced that concept that going down, down, down to the ultimate ground of being, well, maybe there is no ground. Maybe there is no ultimate ground. Just like the earth floats in space. At one time, it seemed reasonable that the earth stood on something, but it doesn't. So maybe all of the universe has no ultimate ground. At times, physicists believed in the luminous ether or the caloric, caloric theory of heat, and then they found that caloric, as it was called, or the ether just didn't exist. It's possible. Another assumption we've made is that the ultimate ground of existence is more or less equivalent to undifferentiated energy. After the Big Bang, the universe, as I understand it, was in a state where even the four forces, the strong, weak nuclear force, gravity and electromagnetism, were united in the one force. And you can think of that as I think you can think of it as energy that was undifferentiated. Now here, this is a, a diagram that is the y-axis is temporal. After the Big Bang, there was just undifferentiated energy and then energy kind of coalesced in the matter and matter, some matter became alive and some life had mind and culture, etc. But we can look at this ontologically as right at this moment. Energy underlies matter, which underlies life, which underlies mind, which underlies culture, etc. So right at this moment, we can consider the ultimate ground of being as more or less equivalent to energy. Now, these two assumptions I made, scientists might disagree with, but I want to point these out anyway, explicitly. Now, the third one we've made is even a bigger assumption that the ultimate ground of existence is consciousness. And I haven't actually made this officially an assumption, but I've kind of hinted at it and kind of used it. And I just want to point this out, that that is a big assumption. Now, there are books that uh, talk about this, but uh, some of them seem to border on the wishful thinking kind of thing, which I'm really trying to avoid. I'm trying to do hard, objective, I want a hard, objective foundation, not wishful thinking. But anyway, we have these three assumptions, hypotheses, and let's just, I want to go with it and see where it leads. And the first thing is, you know, we've talked about this four-part division of God into personal, impersonal, transcendent, and imminent, or four ways of looking at God, I should say. And in the last clip, I said that, um, that our impersonal, imminent God, ultimate ground of existence, is kind of diametrically opposed to the personal, transcendent God of so many religions. But in a way, if we accept these three hypotheses, we kind of include those gods in our fold. The idea being that, as I said before in another clip, that any being which exists, exists in the ocean of uncreated light. And so any being is a creature. And so the idea is, is that if these gods in some sense exist, they're just manifestations of light. They're just creatures as we are. Now, this idea of conscious energy and God is light, I have to say, uh, appears in um, Buddhism, at least something similar it appears in Buddhism, in uh, Hindu. And um, I just want to acknowledge the influences I've had. But let me just say one more thing. If we accepted these three premises, that would more or less unite science and religion. I think if, if natural theology was compatible 
concordant with science, we would have, well, here is what Hal Allen Watts described. That he says that we've broken off science or our view of the natural world and religion into two separate compartments. But that's a kind of double think, the word double think coming from the famous novel 1984. And it's, it's kind of like a, a schizophrenia almost. We're on, in ch church on Sunday, we, we say one thing about the world and then on Monday to Saturday, we feel quite a different thing. We view the world quite a different way. It's strange. But I do want to mention that some of what I'm saying comes out, well, I was born in 1948. I came of age in the 1960s. And it was kind of a crazy time. There were hippies. And I remember there were Hare Krishnas um, uh, chanting outside of the um, a building at Penn State main campus where I was. And the Beatles were learning meditation. And Tim Leary was talking about LSD and his um, sidekick, so to speak, Dick Albert, eventually went to India and wrote a very influential book, uh, the Be Here Now book. And it was just a time where there, there seemed to be a lot happening. There was an experiment. Well, of course, Tim Leary uh, advocated LSD. And he talked about at the higher stages of an LSD high, you'd, you'd, you'd see the undifferentiated clear light and you'd lose your ego. And uh, he kind of, he, he believed it was a mystical experience. And there was an experiment at a, a chapel in Boston University where they used not LSD, but psilocybin, which is similar, but it's plant-based. It's called the Good Friday Experiment. And uh, here you can see the people, uh, their description of the experience was a profoundly religious experience that uh, affected them, some of them for the rest of their lives. It also got uh, uh, Timothy Leary in a lot of trouble. Now also though, that was one influence on my thinking, but I went to a Catholic uh, Jesuit high school and uh, I also got in a Catholic um, elementary school starting in third grade. So I also got the standard Catholic education. I did not go to Catholic college and take theology, but I've read a lot of theology on my own. But these were um, crazy times. There was, there was a, when I lived in Boston, there was a Carthusian monk who had been to a Buddhist retreat and he was giving a 10 day meditation retreat. Now, if you don't know anything about Carthusian monks, you might not know how extraordinary that is. Carthusian monks live as hermits. They have their own cell. They get together, if I remember correctly, on Sunday for mass. And every night, I think they get together to sing vespers, but they live mostly alone. And they're, withdraw from the world. It's kind of like uh, we mentioned Julian of Norwich in another uh, clip, an anchorite that lived in the um, Middle Ages. So at the time, there seemed to be an incredible amount of things happening in the field of religion. Even Carthusian monks were getting involved. And there was, of course, a lot of Hindu gurus and Buddhist teachers. And there seemed to be that a, a new religion, or many new religions, were being born. There seemed to be a lot happening. But then uh, there was the inevitable fall. There was a guru that had, uh, I think, 89 Rolls Royces, and he established a city in Oregon, and his followers uh, uh, had various conflicts with the local people, and there was all allegations of poisoning and whatnot. I, I don't know who was right or wrong, but it's a lot of that seems to have faded. And we seem to, as far as I can tell, be more or less back to uh, standard religion. But I, I'm trying to, I guess, construct a theology that is trans species, that not only were human beings of different religions could agree on it, and it could be compatible with science, but that uh, as I've said before, if an intelligent species that looked like a rabbit that believed in the great furry rabbit or an intelligent species that looked like a spider that believed in the great mother spider who spun the web of the universe from her body, that we could talk to them and say, yes, those are gods who are persons. Those are manifestations of the ultimate ground of existence. And 
of the uncreated ground of being. And we could possibly agree that yes, that is what exists objectively, real. And uh, at least that's what I'm trying to do. But of course, as I've mentioned several times, this puts us in the position of a pioneer. We're going into, at least for me, is somewhat uncharted territory, even I've thought about it, even though I've thought about it a lot and um, uh, over the years. But it's something new. It's something that, uh, well, will the world of religion and theology be the way it is now, 500 years from now? It seems like something like this, not that I'm getting everything right, but it seems something in this vein, something in the spirit, seemed to be in the future, seemed to be inevitable, at least to me. But of course, I may be wrong. Thank you.